atmosphere of it because yeah. I mean I, I kind of feel like there's a balance that was struck pretty successfully if the status quo is upheld um, right now, which is the fact that the FCC made this inquiry, it's kind of like a threat. You know, the FCC starts getting involved, you don't want to mess with them. Because they are pretty powerful. I mean, they can, uh, they can, they can ruin a, an industry, or they, can, or they can make an industry uh, flourish. And um, so AT&T now starts to open up its network a little bit after the FCC starts getting involved and starts, you know, asking, asking them to answer some of their questions. Maybe that's all that the FCC needs to do. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, there is potential that the app, Apple model is so successful and millions of people love their Apple products so much is because Apple is allowed to be a closed system, completely closed, and control it from the bottom to the top, from the bottom to the top. So, um, so there's a risk that, and, and there's plenty of examples in history where the FCC has not done something, has not acted, and therefore it's know, it's uh, really hindered an industry, like with wireless. Uh, I was reading another book from written by a guy who worked at the FCC. Uh, I forget, it's a uh, tough act to follow about the 1996 Telecommunications Act. And he says it, it took the FCC so long to come up with some reasonable rules on regulating the wireless spectrum that it really stunted the growth of wireless uh, technology in the United States to the point where in the year 2000, when I was in ninth grade, um, I had my phone. Everyone in Cyprus had a phone, like in Europe. Wireless phone, because they standardized quickly and early, like everyone had a phone, like even like middle schoolers and stuff. And when I came to the States to visit, like no one my age had a phone, just just like some adult. Not even, not everybody had one. It was, um, the, U the US was really like two or three years behind Europe. And, and this author claims that it's because the FCC was um, uh, poorly, poorly managing the, the development of, um, of wireless telephony. So that's so by not acting, it did harm. Uh, but then on the other hand, if it had stepped in and like enforced a, a standard that was no good, then again you're harming. So there's really it is really nuanced. It's like to what extent should the FCC get involved in a certain issue? Well, again. The, the thing about, I mean, I think the justification for the FCC was that the uh, spectrum, the wireless, you know, the radio spectrum, uh, was the public good, you know, right. Long, right. to the public, and they would lease it to, uh, or, you know, sell the rights to it to various uh, organizations. And that a lot of that has changed over the years. The technology has changed so rapidly that right. the law hasn't been able to keep up. I mean, that's a whole policy question right there, whether the law is adequate to, to deal with the new technologies as the new technologies emerge. And, you know, and there's a question that, and again, emerging technologies and forbearance, I mean, these are issues that the FCC always has to deal with. And, um, you know, maybe the FCC needs some forbearance on this whole um, mobile application uh, development because literally before the iPhone came out, I mean, it was there was really hardly any mobile market. And if there was one, it was just for enterprise. It was like Blackberries. Businessmen having their Blackberries, you know, that was kind of like the smartphone market. That was it. But now, with the iPhone App Store coming out and it being so easy to use and um, it's like a really celebrated device, I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So, now the question is, does the FCC need to put in place some rules to ensure that the continued growth, or does it, should it just step back and um, just make their inquiries every once in a while if something kind of sketchy happens. Let let the consumers decide for themselves if they want to buy into a closed system or, or the Android system or something else. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's fun, this whole industry of, right. of, of these apps for the iPhone. But, you know, is that really different than software applications before? I think it might be. It's the, I think the difference is the whole the way that phones are tightly controlled so much. Like computers, you buy a computer, you do whatever you want with it, you hack it, you can put Linux on the Mac if you want. You can, if you buy a laptop, a PC laptop, you can put whatever system you want on it, like no problem, do whatever you want. But with phones, uh, I guess because they're, they're also kind of fragile, they're not as powerful as computers. They don't have the same kind of battery capacity that a laptop has. They, you, can't, you don't plug them into the wall all the time. And so because of that, there's a user experience that is potentially 
um, the user experience that could potentially be really poor if if the hardware if there isn't a lot of coordination and engineering between various manufacturers. So that's I think that's the nuance is that it's not like a computer where you just um, just have your computer and you do what you want with it with a phone. The user experience um, really matters. I'm always frustrated with the uh, with the iPod, not the iPhone stuff. Whenever there's a flash application, the computer will put up a, a notice that it won't let flash on the machine. And I've never seen anything written up as to why they are doing that, but it seems like it's the same thing that they're trying to do. They want to tightly control. They they think yeah. that having flash on the iPod Touch is that what you're talking about? That having flash would um, ruin the experience. Because it, you, they say it consumes a lot of power, so it would just it would drain the battery quicker. They they want to be able to claim that they can get five hours of talk time on the phone. And it's I think it's a whole point the, the whole way that these phones are much more fragile than computers that they run off of battery power and so you have <coughs> all, all these background processes being spawned and running. And yet they have a, a YouTube application that right that essentially. Yeah, it's not flash. It's it's actually just direct video. And so it, it gets the direct video from YouTube yeah. instead of flash. Yeah, exactly. And actually, on the Mac, if you if you uh, run a flash video, it'll use like eighty percent of your CPU. If you run the video with direct, like from YouTube, without flash, it's like twenty percent. So there's an enormous uh, there's enormous amount of power consumption involved with flash. And if iPhones were, if uh, or if cell phones in general were plugged in all the time, then it wouldn't matter. Battery, uh, battery life doesn't matter. But because so what's their able... logic behind that? Approach. Right. Are there any other uh, open issues that you see here? I mean, that's that's good enough. I mean, as far as the government goes, like that's one. And then there's also larger issues that this book raises about tethering and locking. Um, locking handsets to their wireless providers. There's a lot of different issues in wireless telephony. So I'm just hoping that with this like really specific background story, with this really specific incident, that I can come up with something. Well, you know my position is always narrow, not, not broad. But just in your presentation, I'm just asking for the broader picture. Of, right. You know, the context in which you did. Right. I mean, I don't expect it necessarily to go. Yeah, I know. In my presentation, I, I'm lack. I mean, I could have done like a history of telecom uh, uh, regulation and stuff, but you know, I just want to get get the juicy stuff out there. Yeah, no, no I'm, I'm talking about the book. Oh, right, yeah. The, the issues that the, the book seems, I, I, mean, I don't know the book, but it seems to analyze the issues that this raises, that this whole uh, question raises. That are right. Wrong. Yeah. And so, you know, it's that context. But other questions? Does anyone have this is a fascinating topic, Steve, and your title is, you know, very descriptive. But uh, I guess my question is a peripheral one. As you did your research, did you come upon any evidence the Justice Department is looking into this as well? There's no evidence that they are, and that's actually something that I think about a lot is, you know, why did they go into, why did they um, uh, sue Microsoft? Right. Right, and, well, part of it is it was a Democratic administration, and now for the last eight years it's been a Republican administration that made a settlement with Microsoft, so they didn't really, they're, they, over the last eight years they've been, um, they haven't been as, uh, like, active in, in that field, in, in antitrust, in right. software. And so there, that could just be a precedent that they're following. You know, don't really raise antitrust issues in software unless, I mean, unless the iPhone turns out, but we'll see, it never, iPhone's never going to be 100% of the market because it's expensive. I mean, you can get a free phone. Any, any provider out there is going to give you a free phone with a two-year contract. Right. And there's always going to be people that want the free phone instead of the $100 or $300 phone. So I don't, I don't see Apple ever getting to the point where it's like an absolute, mar um, absolute uh, monopoly. Um, but the whole way that they control the software, I can right. see... Uh, I don't really see, I see the FCC, because the FCC is charged with dealing with uh, anti-competitive anti behavior in telecom. So right. 
So I don't really see the Department of Justice getting involved. Brian, did you? You had your hand up before. Maybe you forgot. Well, my main, my main concern with this, if I were writing a paper like this, would be how much literature is available for me to consume. There's like a handful of, um, I went on Google Scholar, typed in iPhone. There's like a, ha there's a handful of articles on like the locking, like the rules between them, the DMCA uh, locking exceptions, like or ex exempt exemptions. Um, some people are arguing that the DMCA should exempt unlocking a phone as a, um, because you know, the DMCA uh, uh, makes it unlawful to provide software that circumvents the protective, uh, so you know, so circumvents the, um, Anti, the anti-locking, you know, app restrictions on a phone. So, technically, if you unlock your iPhone, you're breaking the DMCA, and so they're making an argument that that should be an exemption. So that's one like legal component to it. And um, but you know, this is such a new issue that it, it takes, you know, from the time you start researching a paper to when it gets submitted to a journal to when it gets published, it's like you know, two years or something. So this just happened in the summer. So actually, that's kind of one reason why I chose it. But of course, <laughs> of course, the uh, the thing is now people publish everything on the web. Yeah, right. Anyway, before they publish it, the there's a lot of great like legal right. logs, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, um, technology law podcasts. They've they've been discussing this issue. Yeah. There's some. Hey, for us to come up on Google Scholar, it's like yeah. two months. Ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. Do you know who J. Alex Haldeman is? He's a professor here at the, in the computer science department. No. He deals with hacking uh, devices and things like that. You might want to shoot him an email because I think he'd be interested in this. He might you know if he's not doing research on the iPhone right now. He he's the guy who's going to know who this. So that might help you out. Actually, that's a, that's very good advice because uh, when you're dealing with something that's so recent, so current, right. Cyprus. I wanted to be able to use my cell phone in Cyprus using my SIM card from my from my provider in Cyprus. So I unlocked my phone, and then I was able to use it in Cyprus, like as if you know, like the, any other phone. So I, I had my Cyprus number on my phone. So because otherwise, if you don't unlock your phone and you go abroad, you got to pay up the nose for roaming yeah, fees. Um, well, yeah, no, those those weren't roaming fees. Those were just like international calls, but. Roaming, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, you've got to pay, like, a dollar a minute for a local call. So, it's so you were able to unlock your phone and then yeah. use it locally. Yeah. But you had an AT&T account? Yeah, so I just took, it's a SIM card, you know, like, um, if you have a... You had to you, open your phone? Yeah, you, the you, card on the top, you just put a paper clip in, okay. SIM card pops out, you put in your Cypress SIM card in, and then you're connected to the, you're connected with that account. Cypress account. That's 
That's all you had to do that. Yeah. The phone. Well, no, unlock. You have to actually. You have to install software on your computer and interfaces with your phone, and then it it, it uh, like um, basically injects like arbitrary code into your phone so that it can go beyond the restrictions that are in the phone. And it actually um, there's a communication baseband, which is like the, the processor of the cell phone antenna. And that processor is, in, you know, it's in the firmware of the baseband says only work on AT&T. So you have to hack the firmware. Um, but it's actually pretty, it's not that difficult. You don't have to, like, run a command in a terminal or anything. You just open a program. And um, so it, it's, not, it's not that hard. It's easy enough for, like, for me to do it. And so I, then when you came back to the States, did you uh, hack it back to the AT&T? Then, well, if it's unlocked, then it works anywhere. So I just put the, the old SIM card back in. And it worked on at and Yeah. And in the meantime, I was paying my... So even though I was out of the country for a couple of weeks, I was still, you know, paying... It, it's not like they prorated me two weeks off my bill. No, of Because I wasn't not. there, you know, of so... Of course not. But then, but then, if you wanted to, uh, could you find a cheaper network than at and I don't know if T-Mobile is any cheaper yeah. than... Uh, if anyone knows, if someone can Google that. But... It's got better reception. Better reception? Like certain areas. Right. For Verizon. Yeah, Verizon can't use it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was trying to put that. That's such a weird cable yeah. that we have. But, I mean, I just, this is, this is totally off the subject. Right. I think we've exhausted most of the <laughs> substantive questions, so I was just curious about that. I deliberately did not get an iPhone. I got an iPod Touch and I have a separate phone. Right. And I did that deliberately because, uh, first of all, uh, I was told by I know who have uh, uh, internet through the telephone network that it often is clogged and difficult and slow and you know, it's not really worth very much. And yes, you can you can access the internet from the back seat of a taxi cab in a remote area, but but the 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 thing I wanted was using the internet where I had wireless right. internet, which is most everywhere. And I wanted a separate phone. the data portion of the yeah. iPhone bill is like thirty dollars a month. Right. So and on top of the forty that's like the minimum. Right. And that's of right. course why you get the iPhone for a hundred dollars in the package. You well yeah, because you're gonna be paying over the course of two years, you're right. gonna be more than making up for the cost of the right. hardware. That's how it works. Right. So I deliberately decided to, to do that. I was just asking all these questions to see if this was the right decision. I never regretted it. Traveling internationally, you don't want to use the, you don't want to roam, using, you don't want to no, use the internet. No, but what you did, what you did with your phone obviated the roaming charge and everything. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So that worked, but you could have used the iPod anywhere there was a Wi-Fi link. Yeah, exactly. And that is probably available where you wherever you were going. Yeah. And then you could use Skype. Yeah. On the iPod. I've only used that a couple of times because I have the cell phone, but it worked fine. Yeah, I've used it before. It's pretty fun. It's incredible. I mean, it's, just, you know, it's like <coughs> nobody can. The only thing I haven't done, of course, is figured out a way to get people to be able to call me. On the yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> they say it works, but it isn't. Only if you have like the application. You have to like plan the time. Say at this hour, at this minute, call me. I'll have the application open. Because it, it doesn't run, it doesn't multitask. It doesn't run in the background. They get all the email. Yeah. I was just curious about that. Anybody else have any? I obviously have an expert here. <laughs> you know, this is why I chose this topic, because it's like I go on these sites every day, like looking at Mac news and stuff and iPhone news, and so like why not just use yeah, that in yeah. the background and like yeah. try to find some information policy component to it. Just talk to you about so I guess I just ask you the question: What do you what do you think? Do you think Apple should be allowed to do this? Like, what 
was yours. Yeah, so, you never gave that. You know, it's hard oh, because, like, I'm such a fanboy. I'm like, you know those Apple fanboys that you hate that are like, oh, I love you, iPhone can do no wrong. Like, I'm one of those, so, like, it's kind of hard. But, um, so thinking more of, like, an information policy person, um, I think they're, I think I kind of like the way the FCC handled it. Um, just with, uh, make it, you know, putting the putting heat on the fire, like putting uh, some pressure on the companies to do something about it, but not, you know, I would really hate it if if they actually um, made, um, you know, forced them to unlock because then there wouldn't be like those really cheap, I like they would lose their leverage to negotiate really low, really high subsidies for the iPhone. And so then me as a consumer, you know, I, I don't have any problem with AT&T. I know a lot of people do, and I don't live in New York City, so maybe that's why I don't, I don't know why. Like, you know, I, I, have, I use it every day on the bus, like I'm like reading the news and stuff, and it works fine. So, like I'm pretty satisfied with it, but then maybe, like, but then I, I can see the point of why you would want to force carriers to unlock, uh, why you want to force handset makers to unlock, to offer an unlocked version. Like, that's what they have in France. Like, you can, you can bundle the phone with the carrier, but you also have to provide an unlocked version for sale at a higher price. And that's not the law here. And I can see why that would be reasonable, like, not reasonable, I can see why that would be, like, a good thing. But then from, when you have so much power in the government, like in the FCC, like, you really want to be careful not to kind of ruin something that so far has been such a huge success. Well, the, to what extent do you see the, uh, Google sort of has the open model as opposed to Apple right. in, this, in this structure. Do you see that uh, similar to the IBM PC you know, in earlier years, the open IBM PC architecture versus the Apple closed architecture that they use? Same thing. I think the reason why it's not the same is just the price point. Like, I think when the IBM PC was out, it was like thousand, two thousand dollars cheaper than the Mac. So that's probably the reason why most people bought it. And um, whereas the iPhone actually is priced pretty competitively. I mean, if you want to buy like a, well, actually nowadays if you want to get like a BlackBerry or something, you can get them for free. But a hundred dollars is not an unreasonable amount of money to spend up front on, on a phone if you think it's really cool. So I think, and the market share numbers kind of speak that as well, the fact that it's number two. Um, but so you're asking, like, if you think in the long run it's going to hurt Apple too? See, I don't think they really, see, they want to make money. Like, I don't think they really care if they have, if they're the number one uh, cell phone platform. I think what they care is, like, they're making billions of dollars of profit every single quarter, and they have a really high satisfaction rate, and which they do. Well, if you look historically, I mean, it took it took Apple years to sort of, uh, you know, close the gap between the uh, between the PC and the Mac. I mean, for years they were less than ten percent of the market. Yeah. And less than ten percent market share, uh, and and they weren't. You know, there were times when they weren't really making very much money either. I mean, they were right. really not doing very well. So there was a period of time when when you would argue. You couldn't make that argument that market share speaks for itself, the profit speaks for itself. Right. That you would have to say that their policy was wrong. And then eventually, uh, I, I don't know, I think I think they really did uh, improve their products to the point in our, and, and change their business model in such a way that they became very successful. Uh, and their market share, I think, has risen so substantially against the PC and IBM. Right. Sold, they sold their operation to the Melbourne's. So, you know, it, it interests me. You're, you're really talking about business models here. In fact, that's what your second point is. is right. Whether, whether that, you know, how that's going to shake out. But I guess nobody really knows that. You know, you can't really tell. You know, I think Google is very powerful. Company. This Android platform is probably going to uh, rise very quickly because it's only in, it, in its infancy right now. Right. And it doesn't have all the capabilities that you would expect of it. Like, I was reading, I was going on Wikipedia, and I'm just reading some of the basic features of Android, and there was like a criticism section, and it said like, doesn't have this Bluetooth capability, doesn't have, so I mean like, it can make a lot of improvements, and they will. And um, the fact that 
T-Mobile has it, like the Android platform. T-Mobile Sprint, uh, <coughs> I don't know about Sprint, but uh, Verizon. And uh, actually, AT&T is going to launch uh, an Android-based phone in 2010. So, I mean, I think they're going to probably write, like, Android phones are going to be more successful. But Google doesn't really make money from selling, from selling, it's an open platform, so Google's not really in the business of making money from selling software in that way. They make money from advertising, from search, and from uh, providing well, services that, that people true, use. but I think, their, I think their phone division is trying to make money on the phone. Yeah, I think, yeah, they're selling their phone as a Google-branded phone. But, um, I mean, that's not, like, at the core. I mean, if you saw their Super Bowl ad, like, that's not at the core of what they're trying to do. Like, at the core, they're trying to create great web-based products that and advertise and generate advertising run, run, uh, revenue from that. Not so sure that they're and you know provide an operating system for phones um, for the majority of phones, but I'm not so sure that they're out to. I mean, out to take over the world. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. They got some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going there. Talk to somebody. Good, 